What's up, everybody? Justin Nolte here with I am crazy excited about today's episode because we have been trying to set this up for quite some time and I am just dying to pick this man's brain. I am super excited to have Will Reback with me here today. He is one of the founders of AuraWellness.com. He's a researcher and has just devoted his life to helping people navigate towards better oral wellness, which is super, super critical to the overall, overall health and wellness um, side of things. So I'm going to let Will dive in here and introduce himself. So, Will, what's up, man? Welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having us, Justin. It's a great time to be here. I appreciate it. You're very welcome. I'm glad we were able to set it up. This is going to be great. So, I want to to just start off with the, let's jump right into your story. Your story, and obviously, um, you run this company with your partner, Susan, and you two are just uh, incredibly committed to, to helping the world. Uh, get better oral health, and it's uh, you've actually changed my mind of a lot of things with the the content I've consumed of yours. So I'm a firm believer. I'm just all in and everything you guys are preaching about. So I'd like to know how this began for you, your personal journey of oral health. What did that sure. look like? Sure. So <clears throat> it's kind of funny that you know we a lot of people you know we've been at this for a decade now with oral wellness. We launched it officially in 2009, um, and it's been a, a lot of years that people have been asking us like, oh, you know, they, they presume like we must have great oral health or something like, oh, you guys are in that. No, we're like, no, actually it's because of us that we have oral wellness. <laughs> we don't have great oral health. We're working on this constantly. Um, so our, our origin story really is um, many years ago, uh, Susan and I moved uh, to a new town, went to a new dentist, and she was in her probably early 30s, I'm thinking. It was, yeah. And um, <clears throat> anyway, she uh, was getting, getting a normal dental exam and the dentist did what we now know to be a periodontal exam where they're testing, they're going through two, three, two, two, and they're poking around your gum. Um, and they're, they're measuring the periodontal pockets, the gum pockets around all your teeth. And it got really somber in the room. And the dentist was like, oh, oh, you've got advanced gum disease. You've got advanced periodontal disease. And basically handed my wife a, a brochure um, that said, oh, you're screwed. You have, you know, you're going to cost you tens of thousands of dollars to get this surgery and there's no real fix. And being alternatively minded, like we shared before we started the talk here, um, Susan and I, our background is in the Chinese longevity arts. We studied Kung Fu together for the past 30 plus years. And um, so being alternatively minded, Susan said, well, I'm going to look into this on my own. She didn't buy the the prognosis and um, you know she obviously had the issue um, and so she went home took care of it for a year on her own at home went back to the same dentist a year later the dentist started looking around basically like oh here's this patient again with advanced perio disease um, and the dentist was totally baffled like and actually confided in Susan I must have mismeasured last year and Susan's like no you didn't mismeasure here, I've been treating it at home. I'd like to tell you what I've been doing. And the dentist basically brushed her off and said, I've got another patient to go to. And that, I don't know if French is okay on your show, that pissed Susan off so much that that's part of the fire as to why we're here is because she reversed something that in conventional dental literature is not capable of being reversed. And the dentist didn't want to hear it. So that really got us on the bandwagon of like, okay, we need to share this someday, but it was many, many years later that came through basically a prayer. You know, we had on our vision board that we wanted to have a home-based business that did no harm, that really helped people, that contributed in a meaningful way that was really fulfilling for us, that we could work from home. And, um, you know, then we turned to each other and said, maybe we should be talking about what you did with gum disease. Yeah. Dude, that just blows my mind because it's, it's, I mean, it's an exact parallel with how my company started. It's so really? funny to, yeah, to hear you listen to this because it's just, I mean, essentially we were failed by what we would say is quote unquote, the mainstream. Like for me, we talked a little bit off air about the fitness journey and, you know, I had just been bodybuilding and eating whole grains and eating farm raised tilapia five times a day and just <laughs> had personal <laughs> trainers and all this. And I just felt miserable. And then there was actually, a, there was a tragic incident in my family with a niece that was born, you know terminally ill and disabled and all this. And I just Mm -hmm. really got thrown into this crazy conventional medicine world. And then finding out like the formula that they were giving her was basically carcinogens in a can in a, in a Mm -hmm. hospital, in a pediatric ICU unit, you know, and that's when it just kind of this light bulb switch. And what happened with Clovis was it, I was like, you know what, I actually really need to share this with people. 
And I've said this in other podcasts before, it's, it's, it's not lost on me that it's crazy that people have to come to Justin, a, a random lifelong musician in Nashville, like to get accurate biochemistry. You know what I mean? That's so strange that we live in that place, but it's beautiful you made that same decision. Yeah, and there's a lot of us, thankfully. There's a whole army of us coming forward saying, oh wait, grassroots, that's right. We have the power here. We can instill change because why? We've got the beauty of the internet now where we can speak to one another directly without interference, AKA propaganda, yes. to distort the conversation. That is so important. It's so important. And it's, it's, I like seeing the, the, the general mood around that is shifting. It's, it's far less like, oh, you're tinfoil hat people and more like, oh, wow, <laughs> the information is there and it's abundantly clear that we yeah. have had the wool pulled over our eyes, you know? Yep. So it's becoming yep. a little more mainstream. So if you were to talk about like a, an actual dentist, let's say somebody that, that practices this type of oral health and wellness that you're advocating, what is that called? And can we find practitioners that do this? <clears throat> yeah, um, they're out there for sure. You have to know what to ask. So one, we're advocates, we're researchers, mm -hmm. um, we're product creators, we're holistically minded, we're entrepreneurs. Um, and one of the things that we do is we produce information to make it easily absorbable and digestible. So we created an oral wellness guide for safe dentistry, which is basically questions to ask your dentist. So if anybody listening or watching has, um, has a dentist that they're like, I wonder if this person really you know, knows their chops if they got the stuff that they need. Well, we have a simple download that you can ask them, like full on interview dentists. You know, they're not used to it. They'll kind of look at you cross-eyed, but the ones who really have a helper's heart, which is critically important, the ones who are willing to slow down and talk with you and answer your questions and say, you know, I had a dentist uh, several years ago. He came in, hi, I'm Steve, not Dr. Steve. Stuck mm. out his hand, sat down. Do you have any questions? I said, yeah, let me get out my list. <laughs> you know, and, and we got there for probably 25 minutes. He's not putting gloves and mask on, nothing. We're just talking. I'm oh. like, okay, I found somebody helpful here. Right. So there are questions we can ask, but we actually just wrote a blog not too long ago, talked about the differences between holistic and biological and functional dental models. And there's a lot of different distinctions there. And unfortunately, there's a lot of greenwashing going on because there's no official designator or you know, body saying, well, you can call yourself a functional dentist, but not a holistic dentist because of X, Y, Z, what you're doing in your practice. Mm. So it really is up to us as the public to know what to look for. And yeah, I mean, we've got, you know, we've got a number of articles that talk about, give resources as far as where to look, how to look. We're, you know, like you, we're very much about teaching people how to fish instead of just, you know, here's a handful of dentists that we're going to get kit back from. I don't want that. No. I want to teach you how to be able to find yourself. Yeah, that's so important. And, and it is tough because I've actually looked around actually since consuming your content. I'm like, you know, I work with a functional yeah. medicine medical doctor and I know that's his designation. And I've looked into like, Everyone that I Googled for like holistic dentistry was actually seemed to be popping up as like cosmetic dentistry. And I'm like, well, now there's cosmetic dentistry and holistic and I'm trying to figure this out. And I'm lucky enough that I've, I've actually never even had a cavity or any fillings or anything, but I get questions a lot. Oh, about you're one like, of those people. I'm one of those people. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the gifted. <laughs> but I get Good questions all the time about like if someone were to get like uh, metal toxicity, let's say in the mouth if people want a filling removed or anything like that, like. There's like a, I guess there's certifications of dentists that know how to safely remove those things. And it just seems so tricky to navigate. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you, anybody listening to this, if you've got metal in your mouth and you start freaking out about, cause I mean, it's mercury, it's, it's yes. really, really gnarly neurotoxin, nasty stuff. And it off gases, even though dentistry has told us for decades now that it doesn't, mm -hmm. it does all the time. And it does from, you know, all sorts of stimulation, whether it's from a hot cup of a drink of tea or coffee to brushing your teeth makes the mercury kick off stronger. So you don't want to rush out and get it done though. You want to find somebody who knows. So, mm. you know, that's what we're here for is to be able to help people have the tools and resources if they're looking like, Oh, you know, I listened to this podcast from Justin that one time and the guy was talking about, he had tools to help. So I'm going to go find that download. That's a free ebook. It right. gives you questions to ask that'll really quickly help you suss out whether or not the dentist you're talking to, you should be even in that office or not. Right. 
That's beautiful, man. You're going to get hit with a tidal wave of Clovis people asking you yeah. questions now. <laughs> yeah, well, that's what we're here for. Yeah, man. So in this world of um, health and wellness that I obviously live in as an influencer or whatever you want to call it now, um, it really, I mean, you pointed this out, and I'm getting this from you, of that, that oral health and wellness seems to be sort of like a blind spot. Um, so you have, have you found that even people that are paleo practitioners or keto or whole foods or whatever it may be, um, this is kind of overlooked. Would you agree? It is. It is. I mean, it, it's changing slowly. But if you think about it, like look at the way that each of us dawned to the whole um, real food concept and, and what to really eat. Um, and, and that there were people well before we were doing that that were eating well. Mm -hmm. Right. But, but we didn't realize it until we realized it. And then, Oh, like, Oh, I got to be eating well. And so you do that. And so there's a lot more people on board with that, but we overlook, you know, we, we even think about like what deodorant we should use or skincare mm -hmm. product, hair care products. But oftentimes there's a mental disconnect as we call it. And this is what we've learned um, through the years of having oral wellness, that there's a mental disconnect or a psychic disconnect that we have with our mouths. And it's super weird, Justin, because despite the fact that the mouth is the number one way that we introduce new material into the body. I mean, yeah, we breathe, mm -hmm. you know, we absorb things through our skin, but as far as volume that we bring into the body, the mouth is the garbage hatch. We bring stuff into our bodies through our mouths. So yeah. of course that is, you know, and it's, it's so obvious. And yet we have this kind of surreal detachment from it because even though most of us use them all the time, some of us like you and I more than others, right? Because we talk a lot. <laughs> we can't see what's going on in our own mouths. Mm. And so we get this disconnect from it. And, and it's, it's prevalent in our culture. It's like an over compartmentalization of the body too. I mean, it's very prevalent in dentistry and medicine too. Mm -hmm. That, you know, the dentist treats teeth kind of, but he's actually a doctor of the mouth. Yeah. But he's not. They're, they're not right. Right. right? Because, because the model is built on certain things that they can do to have a business running. Sure. So it's, it's kind of a tricky one. Um, but the, to heal from this, this over compartmentalization is a fun one, you know, it, because once we do, it's kind of like the aha moment with diet that we've all had. Yes. We're like, wow, wait a second. I, I really need to be addressing this, you know, and what am I doing? to my whole system as a result of introducing whatever I'm introducing to the mouth. Right. Right. And you actually gave me that aha moment. It was crazy because I am constantly talking about a diet of whole foods and treating the body as a whole, that whole idea. Cause this specialization, we have these a special doctor for this body part and a special doctor for this body part, and they don't really communicate with each other. Well, and I had this aha moment. You were on uh, the optimized paleo podcast with our mutual friend, Autumn Smith, who, Shout out to Autumn. I just love her. Yeah, She's awesome. fantastic. <laughs> but um, yeah, you, you had just brought up the question or the point that, or the fact really that most people that you talk to don't even know how many teeth they have in their mouth. And I was driving listening. And I mean, I almost felt my face get red because I was embarrassed. I was like, I don't know how many teeth I have in my head. Are you kidding me? And it was instant right. light bulb moment for me. I was like, wow, how could I have just so clearly overlooked something so important. And then you brought up, um, I want to talk to you about this, but you have something called the oral wellness mouth map, right? Yes. Yes. Thank the oral wellness mouth map. It's, it's a simple um, discovery tool, really. It, okay. it helps us heal this mental disconnect. It's basically you sit down with a mirror and with a piece of floss or, you know, whatever, <clears throat> and 10 minutes and slow down and look around your mouth and take notes of what you find in your own mouth. You don't, we don't have to be a dentist to see redness. Right. We don't have to be a dentist to find where our gums bleed between two teeth because it's really obvious. If we just pay attention, if we bring mindful awareness to the action of what's going on in my mouth. Mm. And then we have a dated record of it on the oral wellness mouth map. It's, it's literally, it sounds so kind of cheesy, Justin, but it's, it's truly the most empowering 10 minutes somebody can spend in regards to their oral health that I can suggest. I can talk to you about brushing and flossing and oil pulling and you name it all day long. Mm -hmm. But if we don't know what's going on in our own mouth, how do we know if we're heading in the right direction with our progress? Right. Right. Yeah. It's like flying blind. Yeah. 
That's so true. And this, this blind spot too creates a dangerous situation because like you said, not even knowing what to look for in a, dent, in a dentist or that you'd be seen as almost weird if you interview your dentist. But what's happening here is because of this blind spot, we then are, we're just completely at the mercy of the dentist. And that's what I started thinking about and listening to your content where I'm like, yeah, I walk into a building that is nothing but strangers and I sit in a chair and open my mouth in about the most vulnerable position you could think of with sharp, scary tools. And I'm like, hey, have at it. Right. And, and I have no way to fact check this person. That's right. pretty dangerous, you know? And let's add that they're all wearing masks. Yeah. Right? And let's add that you're paying them. So they're going to diagnose you. And you're paying them based on the number of parts that they're going to permanently remove from your body. Jeez. Okay, you're being paid. You're paying them based on how much they can find to remove. That's a broken system, Justin. Yes. If you really think about it, unfortunately, that's the way we view it. Now, to their credit, dentists mean well, mm -hmm. um, but not all dentists are created equal. You of know, course. I mean, just like, you know, we went to high school or college or whatever, and you had your A students and you didn't have your A students. You had your students that really participated and were passionate about the subject, and you had your students that just barely passed. Sure. Well, that, that's true in dental school, too. That's right. a really good point. Yeah. So it really behooves us when we start healing from this mental disconnect and realize like, oh, wait a second. The mouth has a gigantic influence on the health of the whole body. Yeah. And I need to find somebody who's going to help me optimally navigate this path because it's not just about cavities. It's not just about drill and fill. Yeah. There's much beyond that. Yeah, of course. And it's, I love that we're getting into this because it, it really, it feels it's runs so parallel to mainstream medicine. So in mainstream medicine, we have what I, what everybody calls this symptom based medicine. So mm -hmm. symptom X yields medicine Y or pharmaceutical Y or even supplement Z or something like that. It's all this, yep. let's treat the symptom. But this happens to me all the time in terms of oral wellness, because I am no expert, but just being in the position that I'm in, I get questions about it a lot. But the questions I get about oral health are just like the medical questions I get. It's yeah. like, what product do you recommend for bad breath? What product do you recommend for cavities? X, Y, Z, blah, blah, all this stuff. And like mainstream medicine, it's this idea of you're basically, you know, putting a Band-Aid on a stab wound without stitching up the wound. You're not fixing the root cause. You have these Band-Aid products. So I want to pick your brain on this and find out if you just look at society as a whole right now, what are some of the most common practices and products that people seem to be using on a daily basis? And they, like you said, they mean well, they really think this is good for their oral health, but could actually be harmful. Well, okay, so a couple of things come to mind. I wanna be careful here because at, in, in dentistry and in oral hygiene and oral health, there's a lot to cry foul about. There's a lot to yell fire about. and. Um, Several years ago, Susan and I made a pivot and consciously chose to steer oral wellness in the direction of solutions. Mm. So I can share with you why we don't use fluoride products at all. Okay. But I'm not going to badmouth it because I just don't think it's good juju to do, just for clarity, for full disclosure. Sure, so, sure. So What's going on in the dental health field? Well, we've got an over compartmentalization. We basically, the, the dental field, and I think our culture at large, as well as the product formulators for oral hygiene products in large, um, have this myth. And the myth goes something like this. I can put something in my mouth, and as long as I spit it out, it doesn't get into the rest of my body. Mm, yeah, Listerine, you know. Right. But it's a myth. It's, it's categorically been proven false. It's not true. Okay. Yeah. If you're familiar with homeopathic medicine, you put it under your tongue and it absorbs. You don't have to swallow it. It goes into your system. Yeah. If you're familiar with allopathic medicine and you've got angina, you put a nitro tab under your tongue and it's, you don't have to swallow it. It just is absorbed. In fact, the research has proven that we get stuff into our bloodstream faster through direct absorption through the cheek and gum tissue than if we actually swallowed it. Wow. So it's a myth. So the problem, or one of the problems that we see is that both in the oral hygiene product industry as well as in the dental model, we're, we're 
a victim to this myth that what goes in the mouth stays in the mouth, mm. but it's not true. So as a result, we have to enter into this conversation, not only from the standpoint of what's going on in the mouth, but how is this product, how is introducing this product to my system going to impact the whole system globally? Sure. That's, yeah, that's so really it, the crux. It feels like a decent rule of thumb that just if you wouldn't be comfortable, you know, we t I talk about this with people with skincare products as well. If you wouldn't be comfortable swallowing it, you probably shouldn't put it on your skin. And if people are following that rule, they certainly should not put that item in their mouth, which, Correct. yeah, like the lingual, as we know, is a massive absorption site. Yep. So I do, I didn't plan on this, but I do want to touch on this really quickly, the fluoride piece, because without bad mouthing anyone in practices, um, we do still need to think about the fact that like most, you know, most municipal water supplies have fluoride in them. Yep. Um, so like in my house, I have a whole house filter and then I have a second activated charcoal filter in the refrigerator and I'm really careful about stuff like that. Can you just touch on maybe a, a, a couple things that fluoride can do to a human body? Well, I'll, I'll give you the science as I understand it. And I'm, I'm not a, a, a true authority on this subject, but I've interviewed authorities on the subject on world-class people on this. Um, okay. There is no known benefit. There's no known use for fluoride in mammalian species. Okay, okay. So it doesn't serve any benefit. Okay. It's naturally occurring. We accumulate it. It shows up in some products, you know, plants uptake it. It, it shows up naturally um, and it disrupts all sorts of enzymes pathways in the body. Mm. It disrupts all sorts of enzyme pathways. And, and so really we're talking about two different things here. We're talking about water fluoridation and the presumed benefit that we're pitched, which is that um, it helps to avoid tooth decay. Of course, all the dental literature shows that any benefit that fluoride may have is topical and not systemic. Okay. okay so if you're going to run with the idea of fluoridated water, you would actually swish with that and then spit it out but sure. so you wouldn't even be ingesting it. Um, there's a very real risk for people raising young children um, in fluoridated areas. I, I cringe at the impact that this is going to have downstream uh, for future generations because dental fluorosis is a very real thing. You know, you can get too much exposure to, to fluoride mm -hmm. and it makes the whole skeletal system brittle because the body's got to shunt that fluoride somewhere and it pushes it to the bone tissue and it makes the bones too brittle. Wow. So um, that's, the, that's the, the water fluoridation issue. As far as fluoride in, in toothpaste or oral hygiene products, um, it's, it's pretty well touted by people who are crying foul about this. You know, every fluoride toothpaste has to have a disclosure from the poison control center on it, mm. you know, saying that this product has a poison in it. So yeah. don't swallow, if your child under six swallows more than a pea-sized amount, you know, call the poison, call the poison control center. There's, there's the myth, Justin, what yeah. goes in the mouth goes in the whole body. Yeah. What are we doing with that? And you know, if it were presumably the only thing on the planet that could help us avoid tooth decay, then we'd have to have a second thought about it, but sure. it's not. So yeah. I, I just don't, the, the, the risks just so far outweigh the benefits. I just, it does not compute any longer. Yeah. I completely agree. I completely agree. And it's so new too. We, we tend to look at things as if they've just been around forever. But when you look at the grand scheme of things, that's really not true. And I want to dig into this with you as well, because um, really getting into like the history of, of oral health, let's say, and I know that um, you and Susan are familiar with traditional Chinese medicine yep. and Ayurvedic medicine and things like that. So um, before we dig into the past, I do want to talk about the future, I mean, the present here, the present and the future, and that is that as a, as a culture, we've basically been conditioned to think that things like tooth decay and gum disease are just completely normal when the reality is they are absolutely preventable and weren't always the norm. Mm -hmm. So with this line of thinking that you're on right now, what can people listening to this do to prevent tooth decay if we take fluoride off the table as an option? Right. So <clears throat> let's, let's huddle on this a little bit. The, okay. the stats say that, you know, we're here, we're both near here in the United States. I don't think that it's going to be much different in any first world country. Um, the, sad, the, the sad statistics say that 97% out of 
every 197% of men, women, and children in the United States have some form of active oral disease. Okay, so we have to differentiate between what is common and what is normal, right? Just because something is common doesn't mean it's normal because we could all be running substandard, right? We could all be, you know, we, I like to share the analogy of um, when humans were first exploring the idea of aerodynamics and people were designing these, these cool flying machines, right? And they would go up on top of a cliff and they would jump off and they'd be like, I'm flying. No, you're not quite flying. You're falling. Yes. Right. <laughs> yeah. that, that, that doesn't mean you're fall You're flying. Right. So just because so many of us have these issues doesn't mean that it has to be that way. Mm. And it surely doesn't mean that it always has been that way. So there's a difference between normal and common. And it's very common, but it's, it's unfortunately historically abnormal. And we know this. I mean, we've got the history of it. Your, your tribe definitely knows the work of Weston Price. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the indigenous cultures that he studied. I mean, it, that's a total no-brainer. Weston yeah. Price found that um, in one in particular, I mean, he went all over the world. Um, into several indigenous cultures and studied their peoples there and studied their dentition and how many cavities. And in one group that he studied, he found, and he, they allowed him to dig up the skulls, which was amazing if you think about it with indigenous peoples, but they allowed him to explore the skulls of, of this, this tribe. And he found one cavity in 100 skulls. Okay, so that's one cavity in 3,200 teeth. Wow. Right, 32 teeth in the mouth, if you have your wisdom teeth. One cavity and 3,200. That is insanely effective. Now, not all indigenous tribes were like that. Not all indigenous peoples had that type of track record. Sure. But there's a lot to be said for um, the fact that our culture now thinks that it's normal that we, our bodies are basically breaking down. Yeah. Right. It's just, it's all around us. Absolutely. So I don't know if that really touched on your question but yeah yeah well i, I want to get into the prevention side of things and how to prevent tooth decay but I, yeah. I really like the idea of honing in on on this particular topic because it's the same thing in my world i'm constantly dealing with fat loss so it's right. this idea of what's normal you know versus what has just become accepted right totally. and that's like the obesity epidemic we have a country that's 85 percent plus are overweight oh and gosh. obese that does not mean that that's normal or that it's historically right accurate or that's what's always been that's not the case at all but we just blindly kind of accept these things and what i found that i want to dig in with you as well is the when we talk about biomes like the gut microbiome or the biome of the skin or the microbiome in the mouth and all these things it's so funny because we have an epidemic really in our culture of unhealthy biomes of every kind yep. and americans now have this belief that because their skin biome, their skin microbiome is unhealthy, their mouth microbiome is unhealthy, their gut microbiome is unhealthy. So they have to lather on deodorant and take a shower with crazy chemical soaps all the time and brush their teeth constantly and use Listerine to not have bad breath. So they have this historical assumption yeah. that our hunter-gatherer ancestors must have been horrifically stinky and their teeth must have been rotting out of their head because they didn't have our fancy soaps and shampoos and fluoride toothpaste. But that's really not historically accurate. And that's what's beautiful about Weston's work, right? Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think you're right on it there. You know, the, and, and the media doesn't help, right? I mean, the, the yeah. media portrays, you know, our, our ancestors as being, you know, kind of slovenly and, you know, I mean, sure, they may have lived in caves in certain areas, but uh, boy, they, would we be surviving? Could we go into a cave right now and make it over a winter? I, right. You know? I wouldn't be real thrilled about that. No, nope, um, me neither. So what's going on here? Um, we get this question um, from, you know, because a significant portion of our community is aware of the paleo diet and the, the whole primal paleo movement there. Mm -hmm. And um, we get the question in the form of, hey, you know, our paleolithic ancestors didn't brush our teeth. Do I need to even brush my teeth? And I think that really the way to navigate this is just to intelligently look at where we're at and then determine the best course. And so we, we look at it from the standpoint of why do we do anything? Mm -hmm. We do it and what do we do, right? So do I need to brush my teeth? 
is really a, a what. It's like the least important question. How I brush my teeth and why do we brush our teeth? You know, is it just to scrub our teeth? No, it's, we have certain goals in mind when brushing our teeth. We want to stimulate our gum tissue. We want to thin our oral microbiomes, what are called plaques, thin mm -hmm. the biomes in the mouth. Why? Well, because the way that we look at here at Oral Wellness is that we want to be good conductors of the symphony of microbes in our mouth. Mm. This, is, this is an overarching theme for us is to balance our oral flora, is to be a good steward of this oral flora. Why? Well, because we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't, not only would we not be thriving without a healthy microbiome, but we actually wouldn't be here at all. Yeah. You know, we rely on these, these communities of microbes to provide us tons of stuff. So we have to be a good steward or a good conductor of the oral microbiome and all of our microbiomes. Mm going to reach that place of health. And I really think that our culture is um, still suffering from a battle that occurred quite a while ago. It was kind of a battle of, of paradigms, if you will. And if, if I can segue for a moment, I want to tell a little bit of a story. We all know Louis Pasteur, right? Father of microbiology, mm -hmm. father of the germ theory. That's why, that's why Listerine is, you know, kills bad bugs and that whole yeah. premise, right? Yeah. That's why we have um, pasteurized products. That's which, by the way, you know, the pasteurization was originally for the wine industry, not for milk. But, oh wow! Yeah, that's that's another subject. Um, so we have pasteurization, and so we had Louis Pasteur who taught us about microbiology. Well, very few of us know that Louis had a contemporary named Anton Beauchamp, who had a similar theory, and Beauchamp's theory is called the terrain theory or the um, the cellular or the terrain theory. And basically Louis said, bad bugs are out there. They're trying to get us. And our job is to protect ourselves by killing them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sound familiar? That's, that's antibacterial soap at every station everywhere now. Yeah. Like, oh my God. Don't touch that stuff. <laughs> right. Um, but Beauchamp's theory was a little bit different. And he said, okay, microbes exist. And whether that microbe is going to be pathogenic and disease causing to us, the host of those microbes mm -hmm. is determined by the relative level of immunity of that host. Okay. okay. So he added another layer to the story and unfortunately propaganda wins and we know Pasteur's story, but we don't know Bachamp's story mm. because Bachamp's story is in my opinion, more accurate in that he's saying, Yes, microbes exist, but what's more important, what's of primary significance here is the immunological experience of the host. Where are we at at the moment? So if we find ourselves low on the, if you will, the immunological continuum of life, then we're going to need more germ theory input. We're going to need to defend ourselves more because why? Because we're essentially a, a, an environmental weakling at that point. Yeah. So we have to protect ourselves more. On the other side, if you eat well, if you live well, I'm sorry, I don't get flu shots. I don't believe in that stuff because why would I compromise my immunity a little bit with some germ theory protocol when right. I'm running my immunity up in a place where I keep myself basically out of harm's reach from stuff like that? Yeah. Again, it's, it's adopting what is considered normal. And I think a very weak immune system is what's considered normal. And now we've had decades of this kind of the antibacterial stuff. And now even at least, I think now it's actually, I think antibacterial hand soap is now banned from public schools. Thankfully, wow. they've okay. actually caught up to that, which is great. But I want to talk about some of these practices people are doing as well, because um, we're going to talk about oil pulling, yep. but even oil pulling, if you think about the, the layman's, you know, understanding of that, it's, oh, usually they're talking about coconut oil and they say coconut oil kills germs and that's why they swish it. Right. But there's more to that story, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, so let's dive oil. into that. Yeah. So if we look at oil pulling, um, which is a tremendous practice, um, I think it's been a little bit overblown um, because Ayurvedic medicine did not blanketly suggest oil pulling for all people. Okay. okay. So I think that there is a place to say that oil pulling may not be best for everyone. That said, um, you know, I, I think that it's safe to, to explore with it and see how a person feels with it. Now, here's the irony, okay? And we interviewed a, uh, an Ayurvedic practitioner many years ago, and, and I asked her about this saying like, you know, why doesn't Ayurvedic medicine use oil or what use coconut for oil pulling? Mm. 
right? Because if you think about it, like I, at first I was like, oh, it's probably because they didn't have coconuts. No, that's ridiculous. India is full of coconut. <laughs> yeah. It's not that. I mean, why would they use sesame oil? And so the way that she explained it to us was that the premise of oil pulling, now, first of all, the reason that oil pulling is so good for us is because it's, it's a strategy. It's a technique that's coming out of a holistic paradigm. That's okay. critically important, right? Ayurvedic medicine has not compartmentalized the body into the mouth separate from the body. They recognize the, the unity of that premise of the holistic mindset. And so what oil pulling is looking to do from an Ayurvedic standpoint is it's looking to kind of like, it's not a super accurate analogy, but kind of like oil in an automobile, it's looking to purge gunk out of the system. Okay. By oil pulling, we're actually drawing metabolic toxins up out of the body, and then we spit it out. Sure. And by the way, oil pulling, you always follow oil pulling with a tongue cleaner, with a tongue scraper. You must, yeah. right? So that, those have to go together because in Ayurvedic medicine, they call um, the, this metabolic toxin AMA or AMA, which I think is kind of fitting if you think about the acronym AMA. Anyway, yeah. uh, <clears throat> so... Ama is this metabolic toxin in Ayurveda, and um, oil pulling helps to draw it up to get it out of the body, to basically let the body's digestive system work better. Um, but on a Western side, why do we encourage oil pulling in general? Well, and, and coconut oil is fine, in my opinion. It tastes much better than sesame oil. If I oil pull, I use, I use coconut oil. Okay. Um, truth be told, or I'll, I'll mix them, maybe. But uh, for the most part, it's just simpler to use coconut oil because I really don't like the flavor of sesame oil. Um, but it, it thins the biofilm. And again, if we're going to be a good conductor of the symphony of microbes in our mouths, if we're going to be a good steward of our oral microbiome, then it behooves us to understand strategies to thin biofilms. Why? Because if we have a thin biofilm, that is a plaque region. That's a zone that's going to be protective for our teeth and it's not going to breed pathogenic bugs. Okay. okay so we got to keep it thin. So yeah. oil pulling really helps with that. It's one of the many benefits of oil pulling. Great. Yeah. And I want to touch on the tongue scraper too, because I am hooked on this thing. I start every single morning uh, is the tongue scraper first thing in the morning. And then I rinse it out and I'll do just uh, really like one drop of the uh, heal that mouth blend that you guys have. I just yep. switched that around. It's just a beautiful way to start the day. I've been doing it ever since you and I first chatted. Yep. Um, so the tongue scraper by itself, let's say, aside from oil pulling, there are benefits to just tongue scraping as well, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. What are those? So here's the thing, okay? <clears throat> I made a movie, a video several years ago, a really silly one. It was actually my goofiest uh, video that, that we've produced, and it's horrible, horrible <laughs> content now. It's just the, the quality is just terrible, but whatever. You know, you do your best when you're just starting out. Um, and we said it's the, number, it's the cure for bad breath, and it's to clean your tongue. Mm. Because 90% of the microbes that produce foul smell coming from the mouth live on the back of the tongue. Okay. Okay. Now, here's the fun part. It doesn't just cure bad breath or most, you know, some bad breath comes from other things, right? It sure. can definitely from periodontal disease or, or other factors. It def definitely can be gut imbalance as well. But by and large, bad breath comes off of the tongue. But here's the fun part, okay? We were talking about the microbes in the mouth and the importance that they play. Tongue cleaning provides another important thing, which is to thin the biofilm on the tongue to increase nitric oxide production. Okay, so a secondary pathway of generating nitric oxide in the body, which is super important for energy production in mm -hmm. our bodies, is by exogenous bacteria that live on the back of the tongue. Interesting. Okay, so this is through a system called the enterosalivary, I think is what it's called, it's enterosalivary axis. Okay. And it um, is involving, so we consume foods like veggies that have nitrates, they're converted to nitrites, and then it, it, the system brings them up to the back of the tongue for the, for the microbes on the tongue to convert them to nitric oxide for our bodies to use for energy production. Wow. I know. That's mind-blowing. <laughs> I know, pretty cool, isn't it? So that's, that's one of the symbiotic ways that we have to um, work with our microbiome, in particular our oral microbiome in this case, um, to, to seek a thriving life or else, you know, we're, we're not going to, we're not going to make it. So tongue scraping. Um, one other thing I want to point out about this that I, I think is a fun one. 
and I don't advocate this every day. Okay. I just want to put it up front, but um, you're familiar with, you know, the whole functional medical movement and the, um, the gut brain axis and stuff like this, right? So you're familiar with um, the vagus nerve and the importance of maintaining vagal tone. Yeah. So one of the ways that you can stimulate the vagus nerve is by cleaning your tongue a little too far. Yes. By gagging, right? right. So you can clean your tongue. And while cleaning your tongue intentionally, so you're getting AMA, you're getting that metabolic toxin, according to Ayurvedic medicine, off of, out of the body. Okay. Otherwise, we have a risk of swallowing it back down. You're getting rid of bad breath. You're stimulating greater capacity of your oral microbiome to generate more energy for you through the form of conversion of nitric oxide. And you're also um, stimulating the vagus nerve. By Wow. Uh, well, that's super interesting too, because um, we actually talked about uh, a couple of weeks ago, I do an episode every week, this asks me anything. And somebody asked me about the vagus nerve and we talked about different ways to stimulate it through whether it's cold showers or breathing exercises and meditation and things like this. But I'd also heard that you, that gargling yeah. is a way to stimulate the vagus nerve. Similarly to an ohm, if you're doing yoga, practicing yoga, that vibration of ohm, yep. but, but that you're supposed to gargle so hard that your eyes begin to water. And that's like, you're really getting activated. Yeah. I was like, wow, that seems interesting. You know, that, that, that's hardcore. That's how you, yeah. that, that's a feedback loop that tells you that it's stimulated. I don't think it's necessary if you're doing it regularly to take it there. Okay. But since we talked about oil pulling, if you practice oil pulling and we have an article on this too, that differentiates because most people think oil pulling and they're swishing into the front part of the mouth only. Mm -hmm. In actuality, if you're looking to, with, to draw up those metabolic toxins out of the body and actually help detoxify the body, then you actually want to be stimulating the vagus nerve at the same time by swishing into the, the back of the mouth by utilizing the throat musculature. So that same idea of gargling or singing loudly or mm. gagging, with it's all really you know, centralized on that throat chakra area, that yeah. you know, the thyroid region really. Wow. So can we talk more about, so let's talk about that because you got into like gut brain access and all that, right? If we talk about the biome of the mouth and the biome of the gut, mm -hmm. um, how do those play a role? Because obviously I've heard you say this before that really the mouth is, is step one of the digestive system. Yep. So what role does the mouth play in all of this and how does that connect with like gut health and possibly even things like autoimmune conditions? Yeah. Um, well, there's a huge connection. Um, there was a research study done in Switzerland not too many years ago. I don't have the year off the top of my head, but um, they essentially took people and they said, okay, we're going to um, test their plaque scores. It was all oral health oriented. So they tested plaque scores, bleed points, stuff like this in the mouth, the indicators of uh, relative oral health, right? Cause it's quantitative then. And they, um, the researchers said, okay, you're not going to brush your teeth. You're not going to floss. You're going to do zero oral hygiene for 30 days, mm -hmm. it was 30 days, it might've been two months, might've been 60 days. Anyways, short period of time, and you're gonna eat a traditional diet. You're gonna basically hunter gather a diet. And yeah. then we're gonna test your, your you know, oral health later with plaque scores and you know, bleed points and all that. And what they found was most people had quite a bit of plaque in their mouths, mm -hmm. but their oral health was better in general. The species okay. were healthier. They didn't have as many pathogenic species. And so there's this two-way path between the gut and the mouth as far as the oral microbiome directly impacts the gut microbiome and vice versa. So it's the way that we view it is that there, there is a wave of it, you know, whether it's a, like a peristaltic wave down the body from swallowing down to the, to, to the anus or just the way that we view it is like um, the mouth is the headwaters to the digestive river of the body. So there is a, in my opinion, you know, we're, we're oral health oriented um, and holistically minded. So I like to believe, and maybe it's just my own personal bias, that the relationship goes more from the mouth to the gut than mm -hmm. the gut to the mouth. But I do know that it's, it's both directions for sure. Sure. Well, it sounds similar to the vagus nerve actually. You know, it's kind of flowing both ways. It sends signals to the brain and the brain sends signals to the gut. Yeah. So it, it seems to feel a bit like that. Now, you also blew my mind where, correct me if I'm wrong here, but are the teeth and the mouth 
also part of the lymphatic system with these tubes inside right. of the teeth. Right, right. <clears throat> this is always a, a real eye opener. So our teeth are alive. Mm -hmm. okay. We actually um, talk about this at quite a bit of length in an ebook that we have called How to Stop Tooth Decay and Remineralize Your Teeth because we think that our teeth are basically just like, you know, they're just, they're just teeth, right? And this is a lot of it has been from the culture from, from dentistry of like, you just drill it and you put something in there and they're fixed, right? <laughs> yeah, it's like we have stones in our head or something. Yeah, exactly, like little rocks. <laughs> um, and, and if we want to look at it that way, it's okay, but I'm, I'm going to change the frame there and say what they are is they're actually living crystals. Okay, okay. because it's a crystalline structure. Mm -hmm. And they're alive. They've got a flow. They've got a, obviously a nerve flow through it. They've got a flow of fluid through it called dentinal fluid flow. This is what you're referring to, Justin, that we have direct influence on through a lot of different factors. This was from the work of Dr. Ralph Steinman back in the 1960s. And Steinman, when I first came across his stuff, it just blew my mind what he found. And Ironically, he was a dental researcher. He was a dentist himself, and he was a dental researcher. And he, <laughs> despite his findings, um, the own, his own dental school there at Loma Linda University of School of Dentistry did not teach the primary importance of what his research found, okay. which is that we can control the flow of this fluid through our teeth. So if you think about it, okay, we've got these living crystals in our mouths. And we have opportunistic bacteria in our mouth. Mm -hmm. Okay, Now, they're not bad. Oftentimes, they're good because they buffer our teeth from acid erosion and stuff from foods that we expose our teeth to. So their plaque is actually a good thing. We've got an article out there called, that, you know, is all plaque bad? It's not. Mm -hmm. So plaque is good. But if our dentinal fluid flow is heading the wrong direction, if it's kind of like this suction vacuum drawing these exogenous bugs, these exogenous microbes into the interior portion of the tooth, well now the pathogenic ones, if there's an imbalance of microbes in the mouth and the thug bugs are winning the war there, now these pathogenic bugs have basically like a free pass into the interiors of our teeth through these tiny dentinal tubules, which is the, the, the little passageways that our teeth are porous. Wow. It doesn't feel like it. Our teeth are porous. They're, they're structured more like a sponge. That is so mind blowing. I remember when you first talked about the tubes, I think you said there's like three, what's like three miles of tubing in a tooth or something like that. It's like, yeah. it's absolutely unbelievable. Yeah. So now, that's now a question me, I have. Let me oh, put sorry. A little historical precedent on this because yeah. this is a bit of a piss off for me. The person who came up with that number is yeah. Weston Price in the 1930s. Wow. Why are we just talking about this now? Why is it a mind blower to hear that we've got these tiny tubules, these tiny tubes running through our teeth that are tiny, they're super narrow, but they're wide enough that you can fit five bacteria arm in arm across them. So it's like a super highway for bacteria wow. as far as the size. And, and we're just talking about this now? I don't know. Yeah. I mean, you and Susan were the first people I have ever ever heard say that i was like wait a minute so much so that i'm like i'm like i must google this immediately and like learn more like really i was like are you kidding me i mean it just it, it absolutely blew me away but it's just that's the other question i have in terms of this the the sponginess and the, the plaque being um almost protective in a way so mm -hmm. if we talk about cavities and what the heck cavities actually are and i dug into this a little bit in an episode i did uh, i do these ask me anything questions uh episodes and one was for halloween and talking about kids and candy and all this and i learned about a, a bacterial strain called mutan streptococci i believe yep. that's a type of bacteria that excretes i believe lactic acid which strips yep. away at the enamel yep. so it, it one we can dig into cavities and how they happen what they actually are but this idea, because I've actually heard this floating around now that this carnivore diet is super famous and everything, yep. of people claiming that in the absence of carbohydrates and glucose, that, that cavities may not even be possible. Is that accurate? I think it's definitely approaching accurate. Okay. Um, sugar plays a direct role. So I mentioned Ralph Steinman, um, you know, the, the researcher that discovered that whole dentinal fluid flow concept. Now, what Steinman found is he determined certain things that he could put, unfortunately, rats. You know, he did a lot of experimentation on rats. And he found that he could put a rat on a diet 
and they would get cavities. And he could put another rat of the same family on a different diet and it would be literally impervious to cavities. Mm. And what he found was the factor was, it, it all comes back to blood chemistry. It's the balance of blood phosphorus in our blood. Okay. Okay. It's a trip to think about it, but it's a factor of what influences are going to throw our balance of blood phosphorus off such that now the, the suction machine is happening and it's drawing these exogenous bacteria into our teeth instead of it flowing the health giving way, which it's con kind of constantly purging and cleansing our teeth and okay. not letting them in. So the, Oh, where was I going there? Gosh, that was good, but I lost it. <laughs> <laughs> we were talking about uh, how carnivores have, have kind of claimed that yeah, without glucose, glucose there Thank may you. be no cavities. So, so sugar is one of the primary things that throw blood, throws blood phosphorus off. Okay. Okay, that's it. That, sure. that was one of the things that Ralph Steinman set, found is that if he added sugar to a rat's diet, they would get cavities flat out. Okay. So, now that seems to be a different mechanism than just these bacteria thriving in an environment of say the, gut, the, the, the oral microbiome that may be conducive to these mutant streptococci, these particular strains right. of bacteria. So that seems to be a different thing altogether than this secretion of lactic acid, right? Well, let, let's talk about it from two different ways. It's the same causal influence approached from two different angles. I see. Yes. Okay. So you're right that, so I call it strep mutans. It's the same thing we're talking about here. There's a couple of different thug bugs that are implicated with tooth decay in particular. Strep mutans is the most famous and incidentally, um, coconut oil helps to suppress. It's a good tool because it doesn't kill rampantly, but it mm. helps to just chill out strep mutans. It helps to keep it down a little bit. Okay. So that's why coconut oil pulling is, is a useful tool or one of the many reasons. So by not having sugar in the mouth, um, it's going to lower the risk of tooth decay because it's not going to have the proliferation locally of strep mutans in the mouth. Mm -hmm. However, Steinman did a, a, a research on this. So check this out. So he took rats. He's like, okay, I figured out which diet is going to cause the tooth decay and which diet is going to keep them impervious to tooth decay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to feed them this diet, but I'm going to do it through a tube straight into their stomach. I'm going okay. to bypass the mouth. I see. Did they get tooth decay or not? They did. Wow. Okay, so of primary importance, we go back to the work of cellular theory of Anton Bouchamp. Of primary importance is the immunological health of the host. Right. Our gut is out of balance because we're putting too much metabolic toxin in the form of sugar into it. Mm -hmm. Then it's going to throw the system off. And then it's a matter of whether we have the toxins in the mouth as far as strep mutans to cause tooth decay or not. Sure. That's mind blowing. Okay, man. It's really both. I mean, we go about it from like a global local perspective. Again, you know, my background is, is Chinese longevity arts and yin yang. Yeah, yeah. How can you address this locally? Well, locally, strep mutans in the mouth, acid generating bacteria, their waste is acid generating, it eats of enamel, that all makes sense. Mm -hmm. But if my system is flushing out and constantly cleansing the teeth, they're not going to be sitting up against it and getting a high road into the into the teeth. Sure. That makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think it does. It's, it's okay. so interesting to, to view this whole thing from that perspective of the, I mean, there's, there's so many moving parts to this whole thing, this whole big puzzle, right? Yeah. Now, yeah. how does this, this cavity piece that we've, we've looked at, how does this compare to something like what got you into this in the first place with your wife um, being gum disease? So, Right. Is that, is that similar? I know you have talked about um, the cytokine inflammatory model. Like yep. what, what is, I don't even know what that is in terms of gum disease. Okay. So this, this is actually uh, a really not fun in a sense of enjoyable, but an important story <laughs> to have. Okay. Um, so for the most part, we focus on tooth decay in the whole oral health field. And that's because dentistry has conditioned us to focus on tooth decay. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, um, if you're over 35 years old, chances are greater than nine out of 10 that you have some active form of gum disease going on. Now, wow. as problematic as tooth decay is, I'm going to point the finger back to our roots and really why we started our wellness originally, which was to, to help the world navigate away from gum disease here. With gum disease, you have a chronic bacterial infection that 
has access to your bloodstream, whose byproducts cause the body to go haywire. Okay, so they cause a chronic inflammatory cascade, right? So cytokines are a pro-inflammatory molecule produced by our bodies. Um, you've heard of like interleukin-6 and, and stuff like this. So cytokines are pro-inflammatory compounds that are showing up to essentially defend an attack. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's a good thing on an acute basis. Yes. But if it's prolonged, what we get is this chronic inflammatory pattern that in my opinion, I don't have date, hard data on this yet, but I believe we will. The, the science is de definitely leading us in that direction. I believe that we're going to find that the microbes implicated with gum disease and when a person is actively allowing gum disease to proliferate in their mouth, therefore their body, through the bloodstream and the gum tissue, that they are dripping toxins into their system mm. um, at a level that we as a culture do not get yet. Okay, yeah. so there's a direct, I'm not going to use the word cause here because sure. I, I like to consider myself a bit of a stringent researcher, but there's a strong correlation, a very strong correlation in the medical literature between gum disease and heart disease, stroke, cancer, arthritis, um, bowel disorders, um, low birth weight babies. Um, uh, most recently, there was a research paper put out and these folks were gutsy in my opinion because they actually used the term causal in their research paper um, about Alzheimer's. Okay. Now get this, okay, we're both younger. I'm, I'm probably a generation older than you, but still, um, we don't really think about Alzheimer's much, but like obesity, it is a gigantic epidemic. I mean, Huge. gigantic epidemic. Yeah. And just like the lipid hypothesis for heart disease, these researchers are postulating that um, science has been barking up the wrong tree in regards to the cause of Alzheimer's. We've been chasing this amyloid hypothesis, kind of like we were chasing a cholesterol hypothesis for heart disease for many years, right? Yeah. Which I'm sure you're well aware of. Yeah. Well, these researchers found that a certain thug bug implicated with gum disease called P. gingivalis, again, poly polyphromus gingivalis, we don't need the, it's gingivalis is the second part. Um, strong thug bug, totally implicated with gum disease, always present with advanced periodontal disease. They're pointing that as the causal influence for Alzheimer's. Okay. It, it, that doesn't surprise me at all, because what, what's really blowing my mind here is this, this um, Inflammatory cytokines in terms of gum disease, I'm not familiar with, but I am quite familiar with lipidology and the lipid hypothesis in terms of like arterial plaque buildup. Yep. People don't realize that you could have all the cholesterol in the world. You could have the highest cholesterol on planet earth in the absence of inflammation and these inflammatory cytokines, you are not going to have an event. You're not going to have a cardiovascular event without that inflammation. Inflammation plays a role in obesity. Inflammation also obviously plays a role in Alzheimer's and dementia. And as I'm sure you're familiar with now, they're starting to call Alzheimer's type three diabetes for that wow. reason. You know, Crazy. it's Crazy. mind blowing. It really is. And I think that we've chased it back to this inflammatory model. And, and what these researchers are pointing to is like, where's it starting? And yeah. I don't think it's really fair. I, I'm not going to get on board and say, oh, it all starts in the mouth. Because I think that's, sure. it's, it's very multifactorial. However, unless we heal this mental disconnect with our mouths, we will overlook the primary significance that the mouth plays and the role of oral health plays in the health of the whole being. Yeah, well, I think the easiest way to look at that is one of the best things you can do, I would say that this is considered irrefutable at this point, no matter who the scientist is, no matter who you talk to, no matter who the researcher is, right? It's a good idea to do anything that lowers systemic inflammation. Absolutely. So if we're saying that gum disease plays a role in systemic inflammation, leaky gut and gut dysbiosis plays a role in inflammation, all these things, of course we want to lower that. So yeah, while I, I think you're very smart to be careful with that word causation or causal, it's certainly playing a role. Anything that increases inflammation in the body in a chronic way, like you said, acute stressors can be helpful to human right. health. But anything that is a chronic inflammation contributor, that's going to be a problem. It's going to play a role in all these diseases. What it's going to do is it's just going to suppress 
our innate capabilities to defend. Yes. We're just going to get weaker and weaker. And then ultimately, I believe that what we'll find is a direct causal influence between oral health and autoimmune, which you talk about your inflammatory model. That, that really is it. You know, yeah. you get exogenous microbes or whatever environmental influences that piss the system off long enough mm -hmm. until the system goes, now I'm just pissed. Now I'm just yeah. going to burn on myself. Yeah. It's just a matter of, of I mean, we going back to this in the beginning, like you talked about being, being a weakling species kind of, it's just, it's a game of immunology. That's what we're dealing it with. It is. It is. Yeah. I mean, this, I, I think this is going to be super eye opening for listeners first and foremost, just because I don't think anyone's ever gone. I haven't heard a dental podcast like this, so I'm pretty excited about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's fun to bring the information because just because of the disconnect that most of us have with our mouths, it tends to bring a lot of aha moments. Like I never thought of that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, now, uh, so I don't want to keep you all day, but I do want to get people get to actionable steps and things like this. And you and your company, what, you, what you've done, what you've created here is beautiful. And your products are part of my everyday daily life. So I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, I've watched your videos, consumed your content. I've talked. So my personal routine is I have the tongue scraper in the morning, one little drop of your heal thy mouth. Am I saying that right? Is that how you say it? We, it's kind of a words. You can healthy mouth or heal thy mouth. Yeah, I like heal that mouth, man, just because I, I, I appreciate the pun. <laughs> yeah. So I do the tongue scraper, swish around a little bit of heal that mouth in the morning. And then my brushing routine is the heal that mouth blend with smile. So I use smile as well. Yep. But then I do own a uh, charcoal toothpaste that mm -hmm. I really like, but I don't use it every day. Um, yep. And that's because of the content I've consumed with you. So let's talk about how these these products, like these charcoal toothpastes, are really catching on. A lot of right. people are using them every day. So right. why are they so popular? And do you recommend using them every day? Well, specifically on charcoal toothpastes or tooth powders, however you want to go about it, um, they're catching on, in my opinion, because of vanity. Yes. Right. Because they do whiten the teeth. Um, the um, the concern I have is again, we're holistically minded, right? Mm -hmm. So anytime we are looking to use a product ourselves or we're looking to produce a product, you know, we've formulated all of our products that, that we sell. Um, we go at it from a, a, a lot of different angles and how is this gonna affect the mouth and how is it gonna affect downstream system-wide? Now, why would we, why do we all know the term activated charcoal in the first place? It's before charcoal toothpaste, of course. Of course. We would have, we would have activated, I, I travel with activated charcoal whenever I go out. Because why? Well, because if I eat some bad food, I'm going to take activated charcoal to deactivate the toxins. Yes. Right. So why? Activated charcoal is an extremely effective binding agent. Yes. Right. It ties things up. Yeah. And so... I don't have hard data on this, but my concern is, and again, Susan and I look to guide oral wellness within the principles of what's called the precautionary principle. If we're not sure, if we have a sense that something might be dangerous or might not be heading in the right direction to match both our local and global approach, eh, better just set it aside until we know for sure, sure that it does no harm. So the concern that I have with charcoal toothpaste used regularly is that it's going to be binding the minerals in our saliva and inhibit remineralization. We have natural remineralization pathways and mechanisms that happen in the mouth with saliva. And my concern about daily use, I think occasional use is fine, yeah. but daily use of activated charcoal products, um, we may find in the future, um, it, it might be falling victim to the same myth that it doesn't have an impact cool. right right you know, well so. and you've talked about the whole biome and all the different moving pieces so when you talk about it like that's something i warn people about because my audience is very familiar with with uh, charcoal and when to use it yeah. and i i warn them i'm like listen if you're taking some expensive multivitamin or something you don't <laughs> want to take charcoal anywhere around the time that you took that multivitamin because you're going to pull good things out of the system as well right so I think that's, uh, I'm with you 100% that using that charcoal every day, you're the first person to say it, bring it to my attention. I'm like, you know, that makes a lot of sense. There's, there's going to be some collateral damage there. You're going to be pulling out some good things along with that. I think so. You know, yeah. I don't have hard data on this, but the, again, using the precautionary principle, that's why we don't have charcoal in any of our, any of our products. Now, yeah. as far as what we do have, um, our healthy mouth blend, our health, heal thy mouth blend, we're really proud. We have um, earlier this year, we got USDA certified organic status on that. It's the only toothpaste alternative on the market that's made with 100% certified organic ingredients. 
Wow. That's 100%. amazing. Now we didn't have to do that to get USDA certified organic, but we're like, you know, gosh, that's just where we want to be. Yeah. We want to set the bar there and say, okay, you know, rest of the industry, come on up here yeah, um, yeah. And, and produce something that is really that clean. Um, and then Oral Wellness Shine is our, our remineralizing tooth whitening powder. And we took a real deep dive several years ago into the research on the remineralization pathways. And it really, Healthy Mouth Blend was our first product. And, uh, and then we brought Shine out many years later, just basically out of the desire, wouldn't it be great to be able to offer somebody out for the world something that would help with, with tooth decay and help to um, remineralize teeth, protect against um, future decay, as well as ad address any existing decay. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I wanna put a caveat in here and say that we've got a misunderstanding as a culture around cavities. And that's like, oh, I've got this big hole in my tooth, and if I use Shine or some other product that claims to remineralize, that um, my cavity is going to fill in. Yeah. That's not the case from my perspective. Okay, okay. That's, that's kind of too grandiose, and, and we're very firmly rooted in the idea of, of not propagating false hope, but by actually providing real solutions that help within the parameters of, as we understand the research, really happening. Yeah. So what Shine is going to do is it's going to harden and remineralize the surface of whatever's there. So you can arrest decay in an active cavity. You can stop the decay process from continuing in an active cavity, but it's not going to fill the hole. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so it's there's like a little a bit of a vent in your hole or something. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Um, so the way that we approach it is, is kind of like this two-pronged biological and chemical approach. You, gotta, you have to rebalance the oral flora. You've got to address the oral microbiome and make sure that your microbiome is, is at a healthy place. And that's where the healthy mouth blend is really focused more because we're really dealing with thinning biofilms and, and a lot of different technical stuff around adhesion inhibition and making sure that, um, that the flora in the mouth is um, not predominantly thug bugs. Mm -hmm. And then let's address the chemistry. And, and really the secret sauce to shine is um, what's called MCHA. It's microcrystalline hydroxyapatite. Okay, it's a big word. Normally I teach people, we're like, uh, if it's a big word that you can't pronounce easily, probably best to leave it out of your body. But in this case, yeah, a lot of people MCHA, do that. yeah, I, you know, yeah. to a certain degree, I think that's a good rule of thumb. But, sure. Um, if, if we don't know what it is and in the case of MCHA, MCHA is um, super, so microcrystalline, okay, super, super tiny crystal particle size of hydroxyapatite. Well, hydroxyapatite is a molecular compound of calcium and phosphorus with a little um, oxygen hydrogen there, which is bone. Mm -hmm. That's our structure of bone tissue. We produce the microcrystalline hydroxyapatite from New Zealand pastured cattle. Okay, so wow. it's it's food grade, super, super, super tiny pastured New Zealand cattle bone that you're brushing with. Well, that's one of the components in, in Shine yeah. that helps. Why? Well, because the research really clearly shows that if you use hydroxyapatite on your teeth, it actually rem remineralizes and in some cases even better than fluoride. Okay. Okay. So going back to fluoride, we're like, okay, fluoride theoretically hardens teeth, but it's bad for the system in general. Hydroxyapatite yeah. remineralizes the teeth. It doesn't do it in a way that fluoride does that isn't quite as healthy in my opinion, because it, without getting into the hard chemistry there, it's different. Mm -hmm. um, and yet it does so without a negative impact globally through the whole system. Yeah. Right. So it's a very different approach. Um, and this hydroxyapatite, people take it, it's like a super bioavailable form of calcium and phosphorus. They take it as a supplement oftentimes too. Wow. So um, really good stuff. I mean, the formula is there for a reason. It's not just with hydroxyapatite. We've really approached it from a number of different angles. Yeah. You know, inherent in our studies of, of the Chinese longevity arts is traditional Chinese medicine, like you mentioned earlier, Justin. And in this case, we approach this kind of like a traditional Chinese medical herbal formula. It's like it's got to be right. It's, you got to have different pieces to the puzzle. Every, every piece of the puzzle is looking to achieve a certain purpose. Yeah. And then they all work together synergistically to produce what they produce. And, and thankfully the feedback that we're getting, not only from um, our public 
community, but also from dental professionals as they, they're seeing changes in their patients who are using these products. They're seeing their um, existing decay hardening. They're seeing quantitative analysis of cavities, the demineralization and demineralized zones remineralizing. So that's the proof yeah. in the pudding. Well, I, I want to see if you've dealt with this because my, my little N equals one experiment, I've been using your products for, I don't even know how many months now since we first talked. Yeah. And um, I'm a professional musician by trade. That's what I've done for the last 17 years. So um, for many, many years, I always had this fear because I would be on stage and then off stage talking to countless people, just people come up and they want to take a picture and you know, all these things. And I was always had this paranoid fear of bad breath. Right. So I always had Listerine with me. I was just a Listerine guy. I mean, for years and years and years. And I got to this point where any kind of cold or hot beverage really hurt my teeth. Yep. And when I started using Shine, um, I would, I'd be using Shine daily. I was doing it in the morning and at night. I hope that's mm -hmm. okay. Yep. And then what I found is in the morning when I do that tongue scraper, drop a heel, uh, healthy mouth, and like I'd swish with water, I would always rinse with warm water because I couldn't do cold. And yeah. here I am months later, I can rinse my mouth with cold water with zero problem. So have you had anybody report, you know, decreasing sensitive teeth? Absolutely. That's actually the number one way that somebody can know that something is changing without getting a dentist's feedback on it. And honestly, you don't want to, for the most part, you don't want to be asking your dentist for feedback on this because they're going to poo-poo the subject in general, course, unless right. they're, they're awakening to the potential of stuff like this. Yeah. But yeah, the number one thing that we have found through our surveys of, of customers using Shine is a decreased sensitivity. I remember when Susan is really our canary in the coal mine because of her beginnings mm -hmm. and, the, and the, the roots and the beginnings of oral wellness. And so when Susan comes out, you know, this is now many years ago, and she's like, this sounds kind of weird, but it feels like my teeth are denser. Yeah. That's it. It's, it's so strange. I mean, I'm telling you, man, this is a, it's a significant impact. Like I've actually tested it. Like I've gotten cold water right out of the fridge and I'm like, and I'm nervous because yep. I yep. know what that sensitive teeth thing feels like. And yep. I, I mean, I can swish this stuff around zero problem. Just like, this is, that's crazy. It's pronounced. And, and let's shine a light on this for a moment since you've experienced it. That's without any analgesic. You're not numbing. It's, you're not numbing the nerves in the mouth. It's right. because of shine's remineralizing capacity. That's exactly is, is it. that what other uh, toothpaste that claim to help sensitive teeth, is that what they're doing? They're yes. numbing it? Yes. I didn't even know that. Wow. Talk about a Band-Aid. Yeah, no kidding. Here, let's put this topical aspirin onto your sensitivity. Let's not, wow. let's not address the root cause of what's really going on there, right? Which is whether inflamed nerves or sensitive, depends on what's going on. There's a lot of different factors. It could be some gum recession to where the tooth root is exposed, which is a little more porous. Yeah. Or, you know, several factors could be at play. But I hear you there that, you know, the benefit of knowing the confidence that um, you have fresh breath, like coming off of stage for you. Yeah, yeah. I remember a pivotal point for us as our wellness um, many years ago, the customer emailed us and he was an older guy. He was really just touching up for whatever my reason. And I, we have family members that are helping me awaken to my gender biases. But it, it's touching to me that this guy, this older fella, wrote us an email and at the end of it, he said, I'm beginning to smile more. Oh, uh, yeah. And I'm like, that's it. Yes. That's why we do what we do. Because in our little romantic worldview, if more of us are more confident to talk to someone because we know that our breath isn't going to knock them over, mm -hmm. or we feel safer to smile because we feel like we got under control a little bit more with our oral health, like we're heading in the right direction with that, then... The world's a happier place. We make the world a more positive place. And that for me and my wife is a mission that is worth, that's, that's a life worth living for us. Oh, I couldn't agree more, man. I'm going to, just because of that, I'm going to send you some links to a couple podcast episodes I've done. I have these Just Justin episodes where I just talk Please. about, you know, happiness and fulfillment and stuff like that. And I'll, I'll share that with you. But that, that was beautiful. I couldn't agree more. That's why I do this work. So um, before we head out, I want to do just a couple of actionable tips. I'm just kind of pick your brain in terms of, obviously there's a lot of takeaways from this episode, sure. but one thing I want to touch on is I use your toothbrushing technique since yeah. I watched your video. It's a yeah. great video, just like you in your kitchen. Uh, can Thanks. you just walk through that really quick, how brushing your teeth is a little bit different? Sure. So uh, we teach, th this was actually our original claim to fame is we brought a, 
um, a brushing technique out of history called the Bass Brushing Method from a guy named Dr. Charles Bass, um, who was diagnosed with advanced gum disease as a young man. He was actually a medical researcher and a, and a, um, a physician. He was a parasitologist, actually. He was the first person to carry a uh, microscope west of the Mississippi River to kind of give a historical perspective on it. And he was diagnosed with gum disease and his dentist said, well, time to pull all your teeth, right? That's the solution, right? right. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Dr. Bass said, well, hold off on that. Let's, I'm going to go back to my lab and identified bugs that were implicated with gum disease now that we understand it. And uh, he designed a toothbrush and a brushing technique that through his own empirical trial and error, he found reduced the numbers of thug bugs implicated with gum disease. Okay. And so it's, it's very different than what we do in general because we think about brushing our teeth. And so we think teeth, we think tooth decay, but gum disease lives along the gum line. And so it's a, it's a different technique. Um, and it's really focused on disrupting and disorganizing the thug bugs implicated with gum disease. It's just stimulating your gum tissue, really. It's simple. Yeah. Um, but what it does is it lowers your risk of gum disease profoundly. Just that alone, um, that brushing technique alone can, can do a substantial amount. The hang-up is that most brushes on the market have too many bristles, and so they just kind of mash around. You can't wiggle them down the gum line like our bass toothbrush can. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that's, that's, again, one of the strategies that, w- that one of the strategies that we teach along the line of being a good conductor of this symphony of microbes. So if that's our main hat, if you will, if that's our main focus within oral wellness is to help people realize how can I be a good conductor? Well, here's strategy one, here's strategy two, here's, you can, you know, you can do what's called conscious flossing. That's another term that we Mm -hmm. coined. You can use a bass brushing technique. You can, you know, clean your tongue, various different tools that you can do strategies to what for this overarching concept of being a good conductor, a good steward of our oral flora. Yeah, I'm super excited now that I'm at, that we actually got to talk because uh, all these things are part of my daily routine now. The tongue scraper, the healthy mouth blend, shine, and that bass toothbrush. I remember when I got it, I was like, it almost looks strange because there are so few bristles compared to like a market toothbrush. Yep. And what I noticed, because you're talking about the gum stimulation, when I watched your video, is you put a big emphasis on the angle of the toothbrush. And that yep. was the thing at first. I was like, oh, wow, I'm almost at like a 45 degree angle, like pointing down at my gums, but also brushing my teeth. It yep. just, it really is. It's quite different. It's, it's amazing. It is. It's quite different. And, you know, I mean, again, the, we've got newer videos now on the brushing technique, which, uh, you know, I don't know, that, that first one, that was actually the first video that I made. And it, again, I cringe at the quality of it because it was a decade ago. I mean, uh, gosh, you know. Yeah, but I love it, man. I love the yeah. old school stuff. <laughs> it's, it's fun. It's fun. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's a profound difference when we realize like, oh, okay, it's not just about tooth decay, tooth decay. it's also about um, caring for my gum tissue so that I don't have this chronic inflammatory cascade dripping into my bloodstream, Yeah, which is what gum disease really does. And I, I really think we have not seen the final word on that in the literature and the implications that it has on our system-wide health. Yeah, I'm really glad that you and I went as deep as, as we did on this episode too. I think that'll really be eye-opening for people. So to sum this whole thing up, let's say you had to pick um, maybe top, top three to five things that people can do today. If you're like, okay, if I had to break it down to say these three or five things, this is exactly what I would tell you to do. Okay. One is a one-time thing. And that's go to our site. Like I, could, I can put it on um, a landing page for you, Justin, that is to download our mouth map. Okay. And just spend 10 minutes, do conscious flossing. And all that is, is take a piece of floss, white floss, so you can see. And as you floss each of your contacts, look at it and see if there's color, see if there's blood on the floss. And then if you're really brave, smell the segment too. Okay. Because if it smells, that's what your breath smells like, some tough love here, as well as that's a sure sign of some type of infection. Blood, wow. no question, infection. So you want to know where those places are so that you can tend to those places more attentively because you can reverse it. You can stop it from yeah. progressing. Um, so download the mouth map, consciously floss, check, look, just be aware when you're doing it, bring attention, conscious awareness to your oral hygiene habits. Um, that would be number one. Um, okay. Number two, I would pivot to diet and I would say, mm-hmm. get rid of hydrogenated oils. Um, yes. Because that's, that's just going to just horrendously undermine your capacity to show up 
and and mount any type of immune response. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to attack sugar because we all are addicted to sugar to one degree or another, in my opinion. Yeah. And and that just upsets people and then they don't want to listen to us anymore. Right. So true. But, but it's true. You know, if you just pay attention to the number of times that you have something sweet. Actually, I'm going to read this to you because I don't have this memorized. This is a quote from, from Ralph Steinman. This is a doctor that discovered dental fluid flow. And I think okay. that this will really pull it together. Quote, one must admit that the answer to this multifactorial problem, he's talking about tooth decay here, mm -hmm. is, an is, a, is an improved way of life, including good genes, that's you, Justin, <laughs> proper lifetime nutrition. Notice he says proper lifetime nutrition, not like, mm -hmm. you know, 80-20 rule. I'm okay with 80-20 rule, but yeah, if the 20 is like ice cream sundaes, then that's trouble. Um, proper lifetime nutrition, freedom from undue stress, adequate water, sunlight, fresh air, exercise, and control of other environmental factors. A program of prevention based on sound principles is the answer to man's physical problems. He's not just talking about tooth decay there, mm -hmm. right? To man's physical problems. It is unpopular because man desires to eat his cake, parentheses, and between meal snacks, and have his teeth too, which isn't likely to happen anytime soon, end quote. That is beautiful. So what Steinman found was if you eat too many carbs, okay, we're, we're omnivorous. Yes. Okay, I'm not a carnivore. Right. Um, I'm not a strict paleo guy. I, I, would, I would liken more to um, a, a primal diet. You know, we had, we had dairy cows for a number of years. I would hand milk our cow. Okay. okay so I'm, I'm, you know, and, and I'm of Caucasian ancestry too, so that really helps because I can digest raw milk. Sure. Um, so, you know, increase your nutrient density and stop putting phantom foods into your body that mask real hunger. That's yes. what sugar and carbs do, mm -hmm. right? They're basically false food. We have to maximize our input of nutrition if we want any chance of living a vital life. So literally every meal that we have, we, we, in my opinion, it sounds kind of fatalistic, but we don't have time to waste when it comes to, I'm just going to have these, you know, whatever junk food you want to turn to. Yeah. It's a quote unquote healthy junk food. Yeah. But the industry is full of now. Um, it, we just don't have time for it. We have yeah. to maximize nut nutrition because what Weston Price found with the indigenous peoples that he studied was they had 10 times the fat soluble vitamins and four times the minerals than their um, counterparts in industrialized nations. We don't have time to waste. So any food that we eat, make it nutrient dense. Yeah. I couldn't agree more, man. Yeah. That's amazing. It's, 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 uh... There's so much in line here. I'm just kind of like sitting here, here in awe because all my audience that's been with me for so long is going to be like, okay, it's yeah. coming from somebody that's not Justin. <laughs> you know, it's, just... oh, it's, it's Justin again, but it's coming from an oral health angle and it's saying the same thing. We see that across the board. It doesn't matter whether yeah. we're talking to a psychiatrist, right? You, there's, there's good holistic people out there doing good work on the brain now. It doesn't matter where. We're all singing the same solutions to the, you know, I mean, this is... How can you go wrong with what Steinman just said? So you got nutrition, Ugh. freedom from undue stress, good quality water, sunlight, fresh air, exercise. Oh, well, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. yeah. For that. 100%. So what can we do? You know, like just look at your life and it's simple. Anybody listening to this is like, you know what to do. Exactly. One simple little thing. Don't try to eat the whole elephant at once. So just stop for a moment. Be like, what can I do today? Just one small step. You don't have to figure out the whole thing. You don't have to know the whole path. Just what's one little thing you can put in place now. And if, you've, you know, if you're looking at it from an oral health standpoint, then I would say get to know what's going on in your mouth. Yeah. You know, take a couple minutes and do that. Yeah. And that's been the primary focus of what, we, what I've gotten into with my clients lately in the last several months has been simply a matter of we can talk about macros, we can talk about carbs and fat and protein and exercise and all these things to the cow come home, but it's really a matter of self-awareness. It's like you said, People in 2019, you know how to be healthy. You really do. You know, the information's there. You, you have a basic understanding of like, yeah, these Oreos probably aren't the best decision. We know this. We just need people to get, to get honest about it and have that self-awareness. And that quote, 
that's that's an entire it's beautiful i'm gonna steal that from you but it's just yeah. a beautiful quote of self-awareness that's it yeah. you can't have it both ways you know yeah. and it's coming from a dentist and a yeah. dental researcher that really figured it out and his stuff is not taught yeah so you know we got a lot of work to do but thankfully there's there's folks like us out here doing it right and helping open the public's eyes to the reality which is we are in control there's a tremendous amount of positive change that we can create with very small incremental steps mm -hmm. it's not up to some experts out there Is right that? some gatekeeper or something yeah. it's yeah. crazy yeah all right man so we got the, the mouth map let's real quick we got the mouth map the conscious flossing nutrition let's give them one more let's do a third um smile more let yourself smile more I love that. Bring it on. You know, like we, we're, um, we're really enamored. And I'd like to even be able to say that we're almost friends with um, our favorite musician out there right now, other than Justin Nolte, of course, you've probably heard of him, is, <laughs> is uh, a lady named India R.E. Okay, and yeah. He's got a song that she sings, it doesn't cost a thing to smile. Wow. You know, it does, yeah. you know, it just, it's right there. We have this, um, capacity to change our biochemistry profoundly for free. Mm -hmm. We don't have to, it does, it's not in a supplement. It's not, it's, it's just let yourself smile, bring it yeah. on. Yeah. And you, you don't feel like smiling. The biochemistry says it's there. Fake the smile and you'll start to feel better and then you'll want to smile more. Absolutely. Yeah. They've done studies on that. Just yeah. having the, the smile shape on your face literally changes the neurochemistry. Absolutely. And the fun part is, is not only are you affecting your own neurochemistry, but you're actually through the butterfly effect, you're affecting other people. So now you're actually paying it forward and you're achieving, you're, you're basically being a victim now, a victim, a volunteer of our mission, which is to make the world a happier place and to help all the other people out there looking to make the world a happier, healthier place by increasing the number of people smiling in the world because they really feel good, not because they're BSing themselves. Yeah. But because they really feel good and just let that light shine. Man, I love that. This, I got to do a whole nother podcast with you where we don't even talk dental. <laughs> We're just going to talk life, man. I'm telling you, like, I had no idea we'd be this aligned. It's like, it's yeah. unbelievable. Well, and so, we haven't even gotten into piano yet. So I, I'm going to pick Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> that's true <laughs> we got a lot more to talk about man we gotta we gotta meet in person someday too that'd be yeah, absolutely I'll, yeah. I'll get a lesson from you yeah man done deal let's do it yeah. so good. for the listeners uh let's wrap this thing up and and how can they connect with you is it social media your website all that stuff yeah so aura wellness o-r-a wellness.com um i i imagine on the show notes you'll put it in there I, i've mm -hmm. created a landing page of aura wellness.com slash clovis yes i um, love it for your, for your listeners we got a coupon code there for you if you want any of our products. We've got a free download of um, uh, How to Stop Tooth Decay and Remineralize Your Teeth, which is an ebook mm -hmm. loaded with information. It's a great book. That's really our best shot as far as a, a resource to get somebody heading in the right direction. Um, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, you name it, it's all Aura Wellness. Where YouTube okay. channel is kind of struggling there, but it's still on YouTube. I got goofy videos there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, perfect, man. This is beautiful. And everybody listening, I cannot recommend these products enough. Uh, since I tried them, they have, I've tried a lot of products and a lot of people send me things wanting me to be an affiliate and this, that, the other thing. I've tried everything. And it's very rare that I find something that from day one just stays as part of my daily routine. And your products have done that. So everyone listening, I can't recommend them enough. I'll put all those links and everything in the show notes for you and uh, connect with Will, ask him some questions. And Will, man, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Oh, you bet, Justin. Thank you so much for having us. It's a pleasure. All right, brother. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.